questions. Uh, good evening and welcome to the fifth, I believe, uh, Carry Science Conversation. Uh, my name is Josh Ginsberg and I'm, as Lori said, the president of Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. We're based in Millbrook, New York. We're, for those of you who don't know us, and since half of you are new to Cary events, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, as I said, we're based about 100 miles north of New York City in a small town of Millbrook, New York on a 2000 acre campus and research site. Uh, we are an uh, independent research institute, so we have uh, partnerships and collaborations with universities around the world, but we are uh, independent of all universities for our operations. Uh, we have about 25 PhD scientists on staff, a total staff of over 100, and we work in four or five areas of, 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 of focus. We do a lot of work on urban ecology, and Lori mentioned Stuart Pickett. Uh, who some people call the father of urban ecology, will be talking uh, at our scientific seminar this week. Um, and we also work on freshwater ecology. And Emma's talk, uh, Bugs on Drugs, will we'll certainly touch that. She left out uh, my favorite animal that Emma's done some work on, which is a platypus, and, and the impact of antidepressants on a pl or at least the theoretical impact of antidepressants on platypuses. Um, we also do a lot of work on disease ecology. We are wrapping up a five-year uh, double blind controlled study, uh, $8 million project, looking at whether we can kill enough ticks uh, to control Lyme disease. It is very cleverly called the tick project. Uh, and we do other work on Ebola and emergent uh, uh, infectious diseases and disease spillover and pandemics, which is of course uh, very topical. Um, we also do work on forests. And, and up until recently, I would say most of our work, in fact, almost all our work was focused on temperate forests, which was uh, not unusual, but uncommon in, in, in that many people look at tropical forests. Uh, but Sarah Batterman, tonight's speaker, changed that. Uh, when we were interviewing, Sarah just wowed us all. And we decided that even though we said we weren't going to work on tropical forests, it was well worth in, working on tropical forests and in tropical systems more broadly uh, to ensure that Sarah came on board. Uh, so Steve Hamilton works on tropical freshwater, as does Emma Rosie and others. Uh, and so we do have a history in the tropics, uh, but Sarah has really amplified that. Um, all of our work really is affected by climate change. Some people talk about working on climate change. Uh, as an ecologist, I think it's fair to say climate change is working on us. And everything we do is influenced by the changing climate. So uh, that's the overview. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with some of the smartest people in ecology, and I'd like to introduce one of them to you. Uh, Dr. Sarah Batterman uh, did her undergraduate degree at Grinnell University, uh, and then uh, did her master's and PhD at a distinguished institution, Princeton, uh, which I like to talk about because I went there too. Uh, we did not share PhD advisors, but we had many of the same people uh, educate us. Um, she was a few years after I was there. Um, Sarah graduated from Princeton with a PhD in ecology and evolution, and then became a faculty member in Leeds, despite her accent. Uh, she is half English. Uh, and she received a tenure appointment at Leeds, and we were able, despite her being an NERC research fellow, which is a distinguished position at Leeds, we were, we were able to lure her to the Cary Institute. Just after she arrived when she was still on a, on a full-time appointment at Leeds and, and a research fellow at Cary Institute, she was awarded the Lieberhume Prize in uh, 2019. Uh, those of us who have lived and worked in England know how important the Lieberhume is. It recognizes uh, up and coming ecological talent. And I was both pleased for Sarah, but not at all surprised. So tonight, uh, she's going to talk about restoring resilience in tropical forests. I see Sarah has opened up her camera and will unmute in a second, but uh, she let me embarrass her offline. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining uh, me and 270 other people this evening. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Josh. So let's just start out. Um, as I said, we don't do a lot of work. Well, up until now, we've done uh, you know, a smattering of work on tropical forests. But I'm really curious. I spent a year in a tropical forest, but it was in Southeast Asia, and there were a lot of leeches. And I decided never to go back. But what was it that drew you to tropical forests uh, in, early in your career? Yeah, it was, um, it was uh, kind of uh, by chance, actually. So <clears throat> I. Um, when I was in high school, I was not very interested in science or biology or ecology, but um, my parents were very supportive of me and encouraged me to 
take a year off after high school and sort of spend time figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I spent part of that time working. And then part of the time I went to Ecuador and did volunteer work. And I wanted to do something good for the world. So I went to this organization called Hatun Sacha and I did um, conservation um, volunteer work doing reforestation and community environmental education, things like that. Um, and when I was there, I realized, wow, the rainforest is amazing. There's so much biodiversity, so many tree species. Now we know there's around 15,000 tree species in the rainforest. They all look different. Um, there's so many insects, animals, frogs, etc. It was amazing. And I just, I started to learn about, especially the, the tree species, and I just found the diversity so fascinating. And I started to wonder what is the role of all this diversity in tropical forests? What does it do for us? So, um, but I also, at the same time, I realized that there's so many threats to tropical forests and these beautiful places um, are threatened by deforestation. Um, and, you know, I heard trees being cut down quite near where I was, um, where I was volunteering. So I went to college, I went to Grinnell, like you said, and I just decided I love tropical forests. I wanted to study them. I wanted to learn all about them. And so that kind of fueled my passion. And I just, um, I went to Grinnell, I went to grad school for a PhD to um, study tropical forests at Princeton with Laura Sedin, uh, which was wonderful. And, and that led to me all over the world. So I, um, I work now in Panama. I do a lot of research in Panama um, with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. I also have started working in Brazil in the Amazon basin um, and um, other work in South Africa. So it's, it's um, been, been it, my start in ecology was slow, but as soon as I discovered tropical forests, I was brought in right away. I'm muted, it says. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who doesn't know a scientist well uh, needs to know that while it looks like we're driven by questions and, and are very analytical, at our heart, I think all of us mm -hmm. are brought to ecology through passion. I mean, we fall in love with an animal, we fall in love with a site, we fall in love with a question, mm -hmm. um, and it, it brings us into ecology. And, and you became, uh, in addition to an ecologist, a biogeochemist, which is a, a fancy way of, look, of saying you, you care about following nutrients and elements through the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And particularly tonight, I really want to talk about carbon and carbon sequestration and carbon storage. Obviously, that is a critical piece of, of climate change uh, remediation and, and solving the climate problems. Um, but I was serious, there are sort of sources of carbon and then there are sinks of carbon. And maybe we should start out by talking about the role that tropical forests play as a carbon sink. Yeah, yeah, so this is, um, like you said, like we have this passion, we love these places, but then at the same time, I'm really driven by sort of real world problems and solving these real world problems. And climate change is pretty much the biggest um, existential problem facing us today. Um, and tropical forests are really closely connected with um, climate change and sort of the future of climate. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that. But so for um, at, in terms of the carbon cycle, so um, carbon, all living things are made up of carbon and all previously living things like, um, like fossil fuels. And when, when, we, um, when we burn fossil fuels um, like oil, gas, coal, um, for the goods that we, um, you know, our food, for our, um, the, the products that we buy, for transportation, that releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So we are currently um, releasing around 34 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And that amount is increasing as I'm sure um, you are all have heard of. Um, and that goes into the atmosphere. And in addition to burning all these fossil fuels, we also have land use change, which contributes, also contributes carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And that's around six gigatons of carbon per year. And that goes into the air. Um, and when trees are cut down, when um, forests are burned, um, that carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. And some of it 
then is sequestered into the ocean, into the ocean sink. Um, and that's from the biological activity and the productivity in the oceans. And we know pretty well how much carbon is being taken up into the, into the oceans. And then another part of it is going into land, um, into trees, into grasslands, um, into soils. Um, and that part is, um, and that's about a third of the carbon that we emit goes into, um, goes into uh, the land. Um, and that's much less certain um, the land sink, but, um, but we're studying it and we're beginning to learn more about it. And so in particular, if we think about that land portion, most of it is going into, into forests. Um, and so within a forest ecosystem, we have um, trees that are growing and as trees grow, they photosynthesize, they um, take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere they use that to fuel photosynthesis, they, which then moves that carbon into the, the bodies of the trees where they build wood, they build leaves, they build roots, roots um, and, and they use that carbon to grow. But then when trees die either naturally or through fire or when people cut them down, um, that carbon is then released back to the atmosphere, either very quickly when trees are burned or um, a little bit more slowly, but eventually when, as trees decompose. Um, so that's a release of carbon to the atmosphere. So when you cut down forests, that's a, that's a pretty quick release of carbon back to the atmosphere. But then of course, then when um, there's degraded lands, um, forests have been cut down, eventually um, forests can start growing back either um, naturally or through active reforestation when people are planting trees. And so then again, as those trees are beginning to grow, they're again, taking up carbon dioxide, photosynthesizing, and using that carbon from the atmosphere to grow their tissue. So it's kind of a cycle um, where carbon dioxide is cycling from plants to the atmosphere and back again. Um, but um, depending on how much, um, how much of the land is, currently in forest or is um, reforesting, that really can, can influence this land carbon sink. And then one more thing, I'm sure Josh, you will not let me forget because I am a biogeochemist, um, soils are really important. Um, in fact, the majority of um, global carbon is stored in soils. Um, so there's a huge amount of carbon in soils. Of course, a lot of that is really old. In fact, some um, carbon molecules in soils can be millions of years old. Um, and there's a lot of below ground activity with tree roots, um, which also is contributing to the carbon cycle and then moving nutrients from the soils into the trees and helping them grow. Right, and there's a whole ecosystem down there of there's things that grow with the trees and store, and as it were, store carbon, although there's a lot of turnover and those things tend to live fast and die very young. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the roots we tend to, not as you and I have discussed, not think about the, the below ground uh, mm -hmm. component of it, although it can be at least as much if not more than the above ground. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you cut down a tree and, and turn it into a timber and capture the carbon that way, the below ground piece of it still decomposes and, and is released. So it's, yeah. it's a complicated, complicated uh, uh, area. Um, so tropical forests is, is, uh, can also, as you said, can grow back and can be tropical for, forests can be carbon sinks. You know, what are the challenges we face in maintaining this role for tropical forests as carbon sinks and as we release more and more carbon and hopefully we'll sort of get that curve flattened out and fall over. But, you know, uh, we have a goal of net zero by 2050 now in the United States as of last week. Um, but now that we have that goal, we still put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. So what role will car uh, tropical forests play and, and how do we ensure they can remain uh, active in playing the role of, of storing carbon? Yeah, so there's sort of three components of tropical forests. Um, one is that we have existing tropical forests, which are currently there. A lot of these are old growth forests that um, haven't been disturbed very, by people for a very long time, hundreds of years, if not forever. Um, and those store a lot of carbon. And currently, 
um, research is showing is that the amount of carbon that those existing mature forests are storing is growing over time. And we're trying to understand that because, um, you know, if you usually, if you think about an old growth forest, you think about it as at a steady state where it's just, it's storing the same amount of carbon, it's not growing any bigger. But in recent decades, we've, we've observed that there is more and more carbon, that there is more carbon being stored each year in tropical forests. Um, but the amount that's stored each year is declining. So the, there is this sink in tropical forests, which is around a one gigaton, gigaton of carbon per year, but that's getting smaller. So this is a key area of, of research where we're trying to figure out what is number one causing that sink? Is it rising CO2 levels at carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere? Is it um, changing climatic patterns? Um, is it other things? And then number two, what is leading to this decline over time? So we've got existing forests. So one challenge is to understand what drives this carbon sink in them and how big that sink will be in the future, and then protecting those forests so that the carbon remains there. Um, the second thing is, um, is that we have these regrowing tropical forests and reforestation. And like you said, um, with climate change being such a big uh, um, crisis for us right now, a lot of people are trying to figure out what can we do and how can we um, in addition to vastly reducing our carbon emissions, so our sources of carbon, we also want to and will need to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so a lot of people are interested in this and there's different um, things that we can do. And one of those is a natural climate solution, which is um, reforesting and allowing forests to grow back, especially in the tropics. And that will sequester um, a substantial amount of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Right. And, and with a fairly large amount of carbon being released by deforestation, I assume reversing that also would, would help just reduce the load as exactly. a source. Yeah. So, yep. so cons conservation and, and reforestation or restoration are, are really uh, critical that. Um, mm -hmm. On that growth issue, I know um, there are some animals and plants that, that have what's called indeterminate growth, no matter how old they get, they just keep growing. Was the assumption that that many far, tropical forest trees had determinant growth and got to a certain size, and that maybe now we're discovering some of them just do keep growing? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's. I think. I mean, you know, forests are very dynamic, so you constantly have trees growing and trees dying. So you know, <laughs> it's not like a forest grows big and then it stays big and it never changes. Right. It's that there's always this di these dynamics. Um, and so what we've been observing is that trees are growing bigger and they are, they're getting bigger and bigger over time, um, even more so than they did in the past, but they're also dying more. So, oh, so that act, the, the decline in the size of the sink is because um, basically there's like a live fast die young where trees are growing faster, but then the, I mean, gr trees are growing faster, but then they're also dying faster. Right. So, Right, there's right. just so there's so within the forest there's its own source sink dynamic going on mm -hmm. right yeah. and you know i think people also know i mean we've heard a lot we hear a lot about carbon and the other nutrient that we hear a lot about that you study is nitrogen mm -hmm. and you know nitrogen is really important as a fertilizer and and for uh for plant growth it causes pollution and, and many of the carry scientists look at the impact of nitrogen and, and nitrogen load on fresh water systems. And I'm curious, how does, can you talk a little bit about how nitrogen affects growth and, and carbon sequestration? Yeah. So trees, in addition to carbon dioxide, which they need to grow and build their tissue, their woods and wood and their leaves, they need, um, they need nutrients, they need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, they need potassium, kind of like we need a balanced diet, which has carbohydrate, vegetables, protein, and fat, they need the same thing. And nitrogen is, is sort of like protein, um, they need a lot of nitrogen for, in order to grow. And for the most part, um, trees get these nutrients like nitrogen from the soil and they take it up through their roots and that helps them build tissue that they can grow. But some types of trees have this really special ability that I particularly love, um, which is called nitrogen fixation. And these types of trees can bypass the soil and they don't, 
they don't need this, they don't depend on the soil for their nitrogen for growth. And what they do is they form this symbiotic relationship, this partnership with bacteria that live on their roots. And as you can see in this diagram, um, on the right with the little blown up image, um, you can see some little white um, balls on these roots. Those are called nodules, which is where basically it's a house for these bacteria to live. So the plant builds these nodules on their roots. They invite these bacteria that can fix nitrogen to come and live inside those nodules. And the bacteria can take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere. So 80% of the air we breathe is dinitrogen gas. But that's nitrogen that the plant can't use to grow because it's in this like form that's really hard to access. And the bacteria do what's called fix, fixing it. They fix this nitrogen, which turns it into a form of nitrogen fertilizer that the plants can use to grow. The bacteria gives the fertilizer to the, the tree um, in exchange for this little house in the nodule and also the tree feeds the bacteria, bacteria carbon. So um, it's really kind of a magical process where these trees can get their nitrogen from fixation, nitrogen fixation, instead of from the soil. And so what's, what's the broader impact in a tropical forest on having these nitrogen fixers? And generally, you know, what proportion of, of the trees actually uh, are clever enough and have evolved this, uh, co-evolved co this, this ability mm -hmm. uh, to allow nitrogen fixers to live in their roots? Yeah, um, there's real benefits for tropical forests, not just for the individual trees, but for tropical forests, because once that tree fixes the nitrogen and uses it to grow, it drops its leaves at the end of the growing season, kind of like in the fall, except there isn't fall in, in the tropical forests. But, um, but they drop their leaves, that returns that nitrogen to the soil, and then it helps to build the fertility in the soil, it fertilizes the soil, it helps other trees that are growing around the nitrogen fixing tree that don't have the ability to fix nitrogen to take up that nitrogen and grow. Um, and so it really can help build up the fertility in the whole forest ecosystem um, for all the trees to, and, and can help um, fuel growth of the forest and carbon sequestration in the forest. Um, so you asked what, um, how many trees can do this? So I think our audience might be familiar with like beans and peas, and these are plants in the legume family and we eat a lot of them and they provide a lot of protein for us. In tropical forests, about there are trees that are closely related to beans and peas um, in this legume family. And they are the ones who can fix nitrogen. And about 10% of trees in South America and Central America have this ability and have evolved this special ability to fix nitrogen. Um, in Southeast Asia and Africa, the numbers are lower than that. Um, and just for example, in here where we are in New York, um, very few trees can do this. Less than 1% of trees can do it, like alder. The big, the big one are the locusts, aren't they? Yeah, the black so locusts, black, yeah. black locusts can do it, alder can do it around here. Right, mm -hmm. but it's, it's relatively few. Of course, you know, it's not surprising given that, you know, one hectare of diverse tropical forest has as many far tree species as in it as North America, right? <laughs> so, I mean, when, when, when biologists get, you know, talk passionately about the diversity of tropical forests, it is orders of magnitude more diverse than what we are used to going for a stroll uh, in our forests. Although I will note that we have people from Australia, Colombia, and around the world on this uh, webinar. So uh, those of you in Colombia certainly can go out into the tropical forest and see uh, some of the highest diversity in the world in Madidi. So yeah, uh, yeah. great place to visit. Yeah. All right, so so we we've got this. Um, you know, uh, they fertilize the story the the soils. Um, you know, talk to me about, you talked to me the other day about Takigali. Yeah. And I'd be curious if you could tell the Takigali story because it's such a great story. Yeah, so Tachigali is my favorite species of tropical tree, nitrogen fixing tree. And it's, it's, in, this, um, it's in this slide, um, if, if we can make that bigger. So it's really beautiful. You can see it's got these buttresses these buttressed roots and it's got this coppery bark that I just think is gorgeous. Um, but what's really cool is it has such an amazing life history strategy. So this species grows in the understory 
as a little seedling, like just a little tree with like three or four leaves. And it can do that for decades where it just hangs out in the understory for a long time. It's dark because there's big canopy trees around it. Um, and it's just waiting there and hanging out, <laughs> not doing much. But suddenly if a big tree that's next to it dies and falls over and forms a tree fall gap, which is very common in tropical forests, they're very dynamic. Um, suddenly there's a, a gap is formed and light can reach the forest floor and come down to this little seedling. And light of course is really important. It's, it's what fuels photosynthesis and what stimulates growth of trees. And so this little Tachigali seedling suddenly can, can grow really fast because now it has all this light and it races to the canopy of the forest aided by the fact that it can fix nitrogen. So now it can get as much nitrogen as it needs to fuel that really rapid growth. It reaches the forest canopy. Um, it grows into this massive tree with, with a diameter, a trunk diameter over a meter, three, four, five feet wide. Um, and becomes a, a canopy dominant. And then it reproduces just once in its life. So just one year, it um, suddenly fruits and flower, flowers and fruits and, and drops its seeds to the, the forest floor around it. And then its little babies start growing up around it. And after that one um, reproduction event, it, um, it dies, it falls over, it creates a light gap for its babies, and then they get to they get to grow up into the canopy. So I, I just love that tree. It's, um, it's just an example of the diversity of the forest and how um, so many different tree species have such different um, life history strategies and functions within the forest. And of course, um, that nitrogen fixation is helping all the other um, trees around it eventually. And so another thing, Josh, that we um, are finding in my group um, is that these nitrogen fixing trees, they really, they can support biodiversity. They sometimes are keystone species where um, animals and insects will eat them, um, their fruit, or in particular, where my group is studying um, how um, insects, um, herbivores really like to eat their leaves. Um, and we're finding that Compared to all the other trees in the forest, nitrogen fixers are getting eaten much more. Their leaves are getting eaten much more. And that seems to be because their leaf tissue is very nutritious and um, it's super rich in nitrogen. And so it's very tasty to insects right. and, and animals. And usually high nitrogen indicates high protein. Exactly, which is what right. insects and animals want. So right. I, I studied grazers and our substitute for measuring protein was just to look at the nitrogen content of the grass. And right. you could tell a lot about it um, just from that. So mm -hmm. it's a good indicator. Yeah. Well, so. You know, obviously you've talked about res restoration being important for carbon sinks. We've talked a little bit about nitrogen fixation. Um, it's a really wonderful story to talk about the interaction between those two and how nitrogen fixers are so important for tropical forest growth and restoration. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that piece of your research. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as I said before, reforestation is one of these ways that we can um, tackle climate change. It's not gonna solve climate change. It's not gonna get us to <laughs> give us a get out of jail free card, but it can help. And um, a recent um, report um, from the National Academies of Sciences um, estimates that around 7% of our global carbon emissions could be taken up by um, reforestation globally. So that's not just the tropics, but a lot of it's in the tropics. Um, and and there's a lot of interest in this um, around the world as countries are trying to figure out ways to meet their, um, their carbon targets under the Paris Climate Agreement so that they can reduce their carbon emissions and, and get to their um, offset some of their emissions. And so um, several years ago, um, uh, countries came together under what's called this bond challenge, um, which is a global, a global goal to bring 350 million hectares of degraded and deforested, deforested land and reforest it in the next decade. So that's a pretty ambitious goal. And countries around the world have been pledging to reforest um, particular amounts of their land area, um, which um, is good in theory, but of course there are a lot of challenges to that, which I can get into, but 
um, my I've been involved in root and work where we're interested in trying to figure out how much carbon could be sequestered in um, these, these lands that are reforested under this challenge. And in particular, what's the role of nitrogen fixing trees? And if we think about what species are being planted in these reforestation efforts and how um, nitrogen fixers could help to sequester carbon. Um, and so based on research that I was involved in um, from Princeton, we um, looked at the role of nitrogen fixing trees in helping forests to grow back after, mm -hmm. um, after, um, after uh, forests had been cut down. And actually this was my PhD work. I found that during forest recovery after deforestation, um, nitrogen fixation really stimulates that recovery and is super important really early in, in, in forest recovery. Um, and so based on that work, we found um, later using some, some modeling approaches, um, we found that nitrogen fixers actually help forests to grow back more quickly and that they can store 50% more carbon 20 years after a forest starts growing back. And in the long run, because of nitrogen fixers, those forests can store 10% more carbon in mature forests. So they can really, um, they can really do a lot. Um, and so under this bond challenge, we estimate that if nitrogen fixers are included in the species mix, um, we could store 6.7 gigatons more carbon over the next 20 years. Wow. And that's about five years of vehicle emissions in the US. So, yeah. you know, it's not, Shabby. It's not inconsequential. I know, and I think the point you make, Sarah, is really important that we would love to have a magic wand and solve this problem. And some of the bio, you know, the geoengineering solutions, people are sort of saying, oh, we'll just blast this up into the atmosphere and it will solve all our problems. Of course, it might, but it also might cause a, uh, the equivalent of a nuclear winter. So uh, we have to be very careful on that. And I think incremental reductions and releases and incremental increases in storage really are what this what what, what we're going to be looking at over the next 20 or 30 years uh, you answered one of the questions that's already in the q a because one of the uh, questions was aren't isn't nitrogen bad for growth and the answer is in some cases it might be if you have too much of it but in tropical forests in your studies uh, clearly you saw otherwise i assume that that would mean that that you would either have to add nitrogen or heaven forbid, think about some sort of invasive, not invasive, but foreign species or uh, non-native species in Africa or, or Asia, if you were uh, trying to add nitrogen in through a natural uh, growth, uh, because there's so few species that do it, or are there enough so that you could add them into the mix? I think you could natives. add them into the mix anyway, um, because okay. there are nitrogen fixing species in those forests, they're just not quite as abundant as in- right. But the critical thing is if you, if as, as we've talked about it, if you don't have them in the mix, you store less carbon. And so that if your goal of forest restoration is number one, carbon, maybe number two, biodiversity, but even there, because the plant, animals like the, the nitrogen fixers mm -hmm. as food, you're probably also amplifying the biodiversity recovery by putting the nitrogen fixers in there as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's really interesting. So, you know, people get paid to do this, right? Um, and so I think it should be a great selling point that uh, if you're getting paid by the ton of carbon, uh, you can get paid 50% more per hectare that you recover if you include nitrogen fixers. So that would be a good uh, 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 leading edge for, for the investors who are, are thinking about putting money into this. More generally though, you know, one of the challenges is the world is changing. I, I like to say that, you know, when I got my PhD, uh, we actually thought that we could find the way the, the world works, and that there were uh, rules and systems. And what's happened over the last 30 years, or maybe only the 20, 20 years between our PhDs, is we've realized that, that the one thing we know for certain is we can't predict the future because it is so dynamic. So given that, how do you build resilience yeah. into these efforts? How do you make resilient regrowth uh, where increasing temperature, decreasing moisture, all the things that we know are gonna happen in different parts of the world are accounted for? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of the challenges, so it, it, in theory, it sounds great. We should reforest and there's, you know, there's a lot of interest in it. It's a, a recent poll um, by the UN that just came out a couple days ago showed that um, uh, protecting, conserving land and including reforestation is one of the most popular um, climate solutions amongst over a million people globally. 
So there's a lot of interest in it, but there are many different ways that it could be done. And how it's done is super important for both for the longevity of the carbon that's stored in there, the biodiversity of the, um, of the insects and animals and the wildlife that depends on the forest, the livelihood of people who live in local communities, mm -hmm. um, the um, ability of the forest as they grow back to be resilient. And so this idea of resilience, which is that we want forests that are able to bounce back from any kind of disturbance. And so, for example, like as forests are growing back in the future, climate's changing. And so let's say we get a super hot year or a super dry year, um, especially in the tropics, this is happening. Like forests are going to their temperature extremes. Um, and so we want forests that are able to withstand those future conditions and how to do that, one really critical way to do that is to make sure that a, a diversity of tree species are being included in, um, in reforestation efforts. And whether that's active planting where people are going out and planting seedlings in the forest, or even better, if we're just letting forests grow back because it's the tropics, like everything grows really fast, forests can grow back really quickly. Um, and just allowing those native species that are from that local area with seed sources that are from those local areas um, that are that, uh, to, to, um, to grow back and to create the, the new forests. Um, so, so that's really important because, you know, estimates suggest that only a third of these um, pledges under the bond challenge are um, a third of the projects are going to be natural forests. You know, people mm -hmm. are planting um, monocultures of exotic species like pine trees, eucalyptus, other species that aren't even native to um, the areas where um, they're planted. And, you know, that just causes a real challenge because those, those species are um, likely not adapted to the local climate conditions, the local pests. Um, they, if you just have one species, it may not be able to deal with changing climatic conditions. Right. Yeah. So, so it's a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, but I think focusing on a diversity of species, including nitrogen fixers, but not just nitrogen fixers, because they don't store as much carbon. There's other species that store more right. carbon and that do have different functions within the forest. Right. And those monocultures store carbon, but they don't do much else. And in some cases, they they overrun uh, natural forests. And so mm -hmm. places like Borneo, uh, mm -hmm. where you know places like Sarawak, and I see one of the world's experts on Sarawak is on this call, so I'll be careful what I say. Uh, but places like Sarawak, where so much of of the of the of the nation has been taken over by palm oil, right? Mm -hmm. And that does not. It may store carbon, but it, it doesn't store as much carbon as a diverse forest, and it doesn't have any of the other biodiversity benefits. Um, and and so one wants to be very careful not just to store carbon. All right. So if we, you've talked something some about this, but how do we take this science and and really help managers? You talked about diversity and and all that, but you know, talk about if you can just for a few minutes. Uh, the way in which science intersects with management and policy to, to make sure that we do a better job. Yeah, and I think this is where the science is really critical. Um, and there's a lot that we're trying that we are learning about how tropical forests work, what the role of nutrients are in influencing forest growth. And this is a big question that we're trying to figure out and that my group is studying um, with collaborators all over the world. We're trying to understand how, um, what, how important are nutrients for forest growth? Do they limit the carbon sink in tropical forests? And especially in the future, are nutrients going to become too scarce to support this big carbon sink in tropical forests and the recovery of forests from disturbance? So, so we're actively studying that. We have experiments in Panama where we're fertilizing um, big patches of forests. We have 76 forest plots um, and we're adding nitrogen and phosphorus to, to understand how that influences growth, how that influences the different tree species, the nitrogen fixers, trees that are really good at getting phosphorus and the mycorrhizal fungi on the roots, um, all these different things. So there's a lot that we have to learn about how different tree species function in forests, especially when it comes to the intersections between the carbon cycle, the nutrient cycle, and 
um, and water cycles. Um, we're also, um, so, so, so these uh, management practices and these um, ways of reforesting um, could really benefit from an understanding of how these different trees are functioning in the forest and what the importance is of having a biodiverse um, group of tree species, including like, do we need to have 10 different species in reforestation, reforestation efforts or um, you know, do we need a thousand species? So, um, so this is some of the things that the science that we're doing is aiming to help these reforestation and these, these um, management practices um, going forward in order to um, create successful reforestation and reforestation that's resilient to future climate changes, future changing conditions, but also that are, um, are considerate of the local economies too, because of course, if you have a plot of land, you can use it for growing trees, or you can also, what a lot of people are doing, use it for growing food. Um, and so there's, there's trade-offs in what you use your land for. So we're trying to understand, for example, do forests grow back way faster on really fertile soils? or are trees really actually pretty good at getting nutrients through these different strategies like nitrogen fixation, through using mycorrhizal fungi, through mining phosphorus from the soil, and in which case, if they're really good at using those strategies, are they growing almost as well on less fertile soils as they would on fertile soils, in which case, maybe those fertile soils can be saved for food and the less fertile soils could be used for forests. So these are some of the questions that, that we're studying. Yeah, and, and obviously your sensitivity to, to local communities comes from years and years of living in the tropics where people may or may not have an option on their the, the quality of their soils. They may have what they inherited or what they were able to scrape together enough money to buy. And so mm -hmm. having diversity of approaches is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that there are people on this call where, where we're going to take questions in about two minutes. Uh, but I was wondering if you could quickly just say, you know, what can people do, right? Obviously, we can we can burn less carbon, right? You know, keep our houses a little cooler, uh, switch over to sustainable energy. But what else can we do that will uh, help reduce carbon and and also help the forest? Yeah. So so reducing our carbon footprint is is really important. Um, consuming less, traveling less as you can, um, and offsetting the rest. So. Um, investing in carbon offsets um, and there's various certification programs that can ensure that the carbon that you are offsetting is is being stored and and and, and maintained and in, 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 and locked up um, and another important thing and maybe something that people don't realize is that decreasing consumption of beef is really important so actually um, cattle Grazing cattle production is a really major driver of deforestation, especially in the Brazilian in Brazil and then and across the Amazon. Um, and in fact, um, a recent uh, well, it came out today. Um, a study um, shows that um, about twenty five percent of emissions that come from land use are because are coming are driven by um, beef production. Um, so really, it's really, um, it's, it's really major because the Amazon, um, starting in like the 60s, there was this massive move um, by the Brazilian government to colonize the Amazon, which previously was very intact forest and, but suddenly there was this push to move people into the Amazon basin and there was people cut down trees. And, and they grew, they ranched because it was good for raising cattle. Um, and so almost 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is due, is of the deforested area is, is used for ranching. So um, reducing your meat consumption is, is a big thing that you can do. And then of course, if you're buying products, make sure you're finding um, certified wood products that are not endangered species and that are produced sustainably if you have to get wood products look for fair trade certified products, which also supports local communities, um, avoid oil palm products because oil palm, especially in Southeast Asia is the major driver of deforestation. 
Um, and a lot of the food and the soaps and things have oil palm in it, unfortunately. So if you can avoid it, do. And if you can't avoid it, try and find certified oil palm. Um, so there's lots of different things. Of course, supporting science is critical because as we talked about, um, we need the science to underpin the reforestation efforts. And also just more broadly thinking about the tropical carbon sink, we, there's still huge uncertainty in the carbon sink and tropical forests and its future. And so trying to understand how climate's changing, we really need to know what's gonna happen with the carbon sink and tropical forest. And there, there are organizations, Rainforest Alliance, Rainforest Trust, that really do great work and uh, are also, I think, worth supporting. Uh, they rely on science like the science you do to inform their work. And I, I think the best organizations uh, certainly do that. Um, all right, um, I think, let me check my notes, but I think we're ready for some questions. And uh, let me see, uh, I can uh, see if uh, I'm getting uh, in questions. There are a lot of questions in the, in, uh, the Q and A. So let me just go over there. One of uh, one of the uh, our, our uh, participants, as they're called in, in Zoom world, um, wants to know uh, what's the relationship in terms of balance between underground fungal networks and and above ground trees in terms of carbon storage. Yeah. So soils have a really major part of, they store the majority of carbon, like almost two thirds of carbon in tropical forests is within the soil. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of carbon. In terms of the trees and their fungal partners, um, about maybe a third of the biomass is, or a third to a half of the biomass of trees is within their roots and within their um, fungal partners. So. It's a lot. Below ground is really right. important. <laughs> right. Um, and, and another person asked how much of the beef in the U.S. Uh, is from Brazil. And you and I have talked about this in terms of beef being a global market. And so that, you know, the more that's produced, the cheaper it gets, the cheaper it gets, more people buy it. You know, I remember in my childhood, you know, I'm not that old. Uh, beef used to be considered a, a luxury and it was very expensive. Um, and so the global market pushes down the price. But would not eating beef from Brazil and just eating US certified beef solve the problem? Yeah, I mean, it sounds nice, but unfortunately there's just a global market for beef. And so even if you're buying it from the US, then that's beef that other people can't buy from the US. So there's spillover to other places. And so that's where, um, especially in Brazil, there's been this really big uptick in in cattle ranching and raising beef driven by this global market. In fact, 20% of the global beef trade is from Brazil. So it's right. a lot, 20 Right, and, and so we go back to Michael Poland's eat, 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 uh, eat, eat plants, mostly leaves, not too much. Yeah. Right? Um, and and uh, if you're gonna eat uh, protein, certainly fi fish is better than chicken, is better than pork, is better than beef. And mm -hmm. the gap, quite surprisingly, between pork and beef is huge. Yeah. Uh, and the and the carbon impact. Mm -hmm. um, so let me. Uh, can you? So so there are a bunch of different questions that sort of relate to one another. So I'm going to try and synthesize. Um, one person asks, you know, could you add nitrogen fixing organisms into the mix? Uh, so you're putting you know the the commensal nitrogen fixers into the mix when you plant the uh, replant forest, or are they there naturally? Hmm. Yeah. So, um, like the bacteria. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could you seed the bacteria as it were? Right. And, and would that then require seeding nitrogen fixers that could use that bacteria as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and something I'm really interested in. Um, and I, I know there's work going on um, at different places related to this. Um, I think in general, bacteria are everywhere. And so um, we sort of think that there's, you know, if you plant a tree, a nitrogen fixing, a tree that has the capacity to fix nitrogen, it's going to find bacteria that can associate right. with it. But the question is, how specific is that relationship? And are the bacteria specific to that tree in all the soil? Or, you know, is it forming a less ideal partnership because it doesn't have its special bacteria? 
That's a great question. And, and there's active research on this right now. So yeah, yeah. As with many questions, it's an entire PhD or yeah. six. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, and another question that uh, comes uh, in is, you know, what is the effect of climate change in forests in terms of trees being planted? Right. So we talk about resilience. When you plant for a resilient forest, do you include things that might not be well adapted to the local conditions right now, but we expect in 10 or 20 years will because trees live so long? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and um, yeah, so for example, we know across the Amazon, there's a trend towards it for, and, and a lot of research that's suggesting that it's going to become a lot drier and research that has come out of the group that I'm, I am and was a part of at the University of Leeds suggests that different tree species are really, some tree species are, species are really good at dealing with dry conditions and other species are less good. Um, and so maybe one can consider at least making sure that you have a full range of species for in this example of drought uh, and dry conditions, um, just making sure you have that full suite. And I think, you know, it might be difficult to know like, hey, we should choose this species because this is going to be the future condition because there's a lot of uncertainty in exactly what the future climate is going to be in any one place. But I think if we plant a range of species, then you're going to kind of capture some of that potential right. future variation. So you can think about a 10 or 15 year time frame because the key thing is, as we say in, in ecology, recruitment, right? Which of the trees you plant are actually going to grow? Mm -hmm. and, and once they've grown to a certain size, then, then maybe they can withstand the vicissitudes of a little less rain, a little more rain, a little warmer, slightly longer uh, hot seasons and so on. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the, the ray of forestation and the tropical recovery is really uh, through the questions. And, and one of the uh, participants points out that the bond challenge also includes uh, social ecological uh, mm -hmm. outcomes. And mm -hmm. one of the other questions is, you know, do you take into account the needs of local communities? And I know that you have work with people who do forest restoration but are not actively uh, involved yourself. But I'm, I assume that there are fairly complicated matrices of all the different things one has to take into account. And I was wondering whether either in your research or the research of friends, people are looking at the way we can tailor recovery to support uh, the needs of local communities as well as carbon fixation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so some of the research that I'm I'm leading and a part of in Panama is, is directly feeding into working with people from local communities and also stakeholders from across Central and South America to um, help to inform and to, um, to help with reforestation efforts. Um, and I also have been a part of research in Brazil where we've been working with local communities, indigenous communities um, to both learn about local tree species and seed sources for reforestation, but also to share knowledge and to um, help people who are trying to do reforestation in these indigenous communities. Um, so, um, so yes, either my partners and I are um, definitely interested in, in, in bringing in that knowledge of people from indigenous or local communities into right. these efforts. Well, and, really and I know there are also uh, many projects which work with local communities to get them carbon credits and actually get them paid so yeah. that in addition to food and timber and materials uh, mm -hmm. and secondary forest products, there actually is the opportunity if done right to engage local communities so that they can uh, get paid to do conservation as well. Right? So, Which is critical because people need a yeah. livelihood. So you, yeah. how can we as a global community go and tell, tell people don't cut down your forest and don't do this and don't do that when people depend on these um, forests for either food production, you know, their economies. So um, that's, yeah. that's critical. So I wanted to clarify, I was not advocating uh, putting in non-native legumes. Mm -hmm. I was feeding Sarah a question, so I apologize. There are a couple of questions that I actually typed answers to, but, but please don't worry. Uh, we are not in the business of advocating for exotics as, as a solution to uh, most ecological problems. 
<laughs> anyway, I think we're coming to the end. I like to stay on time and respect people's schedules. There are a lot of other great questions. Um, if anybody has a burning question for which we have not been able to provide an answer, uh, you can go to the Cary website and find my email address, Ginsburg with an E J at CaryInstitute.org, and I'll try and direct you to resources. Uh, Sarah might have some answers. Uh, we really, really appreciate um, that half of you uh, have just for the first time come to a science uh, uh, conversation. Uh, we do in other times, live events at our uh, auditorium with about 125 people. Uh, and we've been doing uh, events in New York City at the Green Space, the WNYC Green Space. Uh, but I'll tell you that one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been starting the Carry Science Conversations. It's allowed our staff and, and colleagues to really interact and, and talk about what they do. I think what uh, our staff does and what our colleagues do is, is really amazing. I think the role of science uh, for four years, I have had to say, I do not understand why we have to question the value of science. And now we have an administration that does not question it, but is being led by it. Um, it is refreshing. It certainly takes a weight off our shoulders to know that the work we do is appreciated by society. I think every one of the people, the 280 people or so who have been here tonight uh, really do understand that. So thank you. Tell your friends, tell your family, uh, tell anyone you can. We're going to be posting a uh, recorded version of this. So if you want to uh, send it on to others, anybody who signed up to receive the, the link for this talk will receive the link for the ver recorded version. Please spread it far and wide. Uh, we really uh, I think are one of the best kept secrets in ecology. Uh, ecologists know us, but the rest of the world doesn't yet, uh, but we're changing that slowly. So thank you for coming, Sarah. Thank you for a really remarkable uh, discussion. And I really appreciate all the work you do. And uh, everybody have a wonderful evening and uh, we're almost there. So I'll say, and a great weekend. Thanks, Good night. Jeff.